Hi, this is Jim Cunningham. We're going to talk about when and how to probate real estate in California, or as lawyers like to say, real property. When do you need to probate real estate? When do you need to probate real property in the state of California? It it is needed when it's needed. And how do you know? We're going to kind of go through that. We're going to go through what the attributes are when you must go through probate court in order to sell real property. How do you go about selling a property where somebody has passed away? So what we're talking about here is a person who was on title has passed away. And the only way, you know, you go to the title company or the realtor or the lawyer and they say, look, the only way is you have to go through probate. And we'll talk about what process is appropriate and how it works. This We're going to cover the, the probate journey. Who can sign uh, for uh, the listing agreement, for example? We're going to cover that. And we're going to co- go over fees and tax issues and a whole lot more. So I will tell you, before we even take this journey, a funded living trust, a funded revocable living trust makes everyone's life a lot easier. So if you're the person who's passed away, you're not here, right? It's going to be all the people that love you and care about you and who are going to be stuck with all this work. And if you're the one who's lost a loved one, uh, give you our condolences. Uh, we see this a lot, obviously, with clients. It can be a very difficult time, especially, you know, you might lose a parent and then your jerk brother keeps pestering you about stuff that he thinks you should or shouldn't be doing. So we we get it, right? Um, probate can be avoided with the living trust. All the sort of stuff we're going to talk about here can be avoided. We cover a lot of this in the book, Savvy Estate Planning, What You Need to Know Before You Hire the Right Lawyer. Now, this is a book about learning all the stuff you need to think about before you even step into the attorney's office, okay? So very, very important. It's out in the second edition, and it's available on our website and Amazon as well. I'm Jim Cunningham. I'm a partner at Cunningham Legal. I have over 25 years experience. We have offices throughout California, and I'm a certified specialist in estate planning, trust, and probate law. I'm also a real estate broker, securities insurance licensed, and a pilot. These are the lawyers in our firm, a great group of people. We get up every day, every workday, go to work. Uh, some work from home some days. Uh, but we're here to help our clients navigate uh, this kind of scary stuff for a lot of people. If you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube page and click the little bell. You'll be alerted when videos uh, are posted. That's typically Thursday afternoons at about 6 p.m. Pacific time. Disclaimer, this is very important. This is not a substitute for legal advice. This is general knowledge, general information. This is don't watch this and go do a bunch of stuff. So uh, very, very important to, to, uh, to pay attention to that. So why pay attention to probate? Who cares? Why? Well, we're about we're on the cusp of the greatest generational transfer of wealth in human history. It's estimated $68 trillion with T. 80% of that, eight zero, is real estate. So when we look at on a very high level, most of this wealth is real estate that's going from one generation to the next. I will say that most heirs, and when I'm talking about heirs, if you're a lawyer watching this, you might say, heir, well, that's not a beneficiary or a Uh, uh, Dave IZ, whatever it is, I'm using this loosely, meaning the people who inherit. So the inheritors often sell real estate, they sell real property after mom and dad have passed away. They say, hey, you know what? I don't want to own that house with my jerk brother. I'd pull my hair out if I had to think about that. I just want my money. I want to live my life. And a lot, you know, a lot of these retirement, a lot of these inheritances are retirements for for children if they're inheriting from parents. Only a, a, um, Only a very low percentage of Americans should be have a living trust in place. If you do have a living trust, the asset might be out of the trust. And that means you have to go to probate court. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about which types of probate, right? Which types of probate proceedings are, because there are different types, even in California in one state. And there are only two things uh, certain in, in life, death and taxes. I will tell you that I am a firm believer that taxes are not going down. We're having an aging population. We have um, our national debt is well beyond our gross domestic product, which is the sum of all goods and services. And and you have this shrinking workforce taxes, uh, folks are going to go up. And I would put inflation in the category of a tax, uh, as well as just the uh, income taxes, capital gains taxes. Probate is never going away. It's never going away because if somebody is on title to the property, all property has a deed, right? If that person who, who owns that property is dead, that person can't sign the deed. That's the fundamental problem, and that's why we have probate. So when is probate necessary? So if you're looking at this and you're thinking, well, 
you know, I'm inherent, mom and dad passed away and I don't know if I need to go to probate and you're just kind of starting out, or maybe you're in the middle of it and you're like, wow, man, this seems like a waste. When there is no fully funded living trust. Now, what do I mean by fully funded? You can think of a living trust as a bucket, right? It's a bucket with a handle. And when you set up your own living trust, you take, you create this bucket, which is a document, but figuratively a bucket that has a handle. You're the trustee of your living trust typically. And you take your house and you put that into your trust bucket. If you do not put that house into the trust bucket, it is not in the trust. It is not, the trustee has no authority over that property. That is done by deed while you're alive. So most of our clients, when they set up an estate plan, they set up this living trust and we prepare a deed that the client signs that transfers the property. You know, If I do a trust, it transfers it from me to my living trust, my bucket with my name on it. So it's still mine, okay? You're not losing any control. It's still 100% under your control. That is one method to... Uh, avoid probate um, is a living trust. Well, if there, what if you don't have a living trust and you only have a will or you don't have a will? If you have a will, a will does not get you out of probate court. It just doesn't. It's a will is a list of instructions and wishes, frankly, to a probate judge that a probate judge uh, can choose to say yes or no to. So it is not a definitive document that the trustee, in the example of a living trust, must follow. A will is is really an ask to the courts, you know, the reality, the reality is most wills once, you know, are admitted to probate, there's not a problem, but still you have to go through that process. And in California, when assets are under $184,500, this is not real property. You do not have to go to court. So if you only had a bank account with a hundred thousand, you have to wait 40 days. Um, uh, and then you can, you know, the ark, was uh, in, you know, with Noah was out for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And for some strange reason, the time limit is 40 days. So you have to wait 40 days in order to do something. If it's real property, there is an alternative to the full-blown, as we call the full-blown probate uh, procedure, but you still have to go through a a court process at if you have $150,000 parcel of property. Probate is the only way to sell, dispose of, or other otherwise transfer your decedent's property. So if if mom's passed away and the kids want to sell mom's house, mom's not there to sign the deed, right? The court appoints somebody to sign the deed. And we're going to talk about that court process of appointing somebody. Uh, There are, however, 10 exceptions to probate. And we'll go through these quickly. We already mentioned the living trust. Joint tenancy, very dangerous tool, quite frankly. It's kind of like running with scissors. Uh, Joint tenancy can have a lot of unanticipated consequences But for the purposes here, if there are two people on title and one dies, last man or last woman standing gets the property. If both joint tenants die and there are two joint tenants, it's going to be the survivor's estate. So you still might be stuck with probate. It's more of a delay tactic. Community property, and I'll put an asterisk there. Uh, Community property, community property with the right of survivorship is a way to take title to a deed. And what we're talking about here is these are these are some some of these are different ways to to take title. So when you go to buy a piece of property in California, you typically go through an escrow. The escrow will ask you, how do you want to hold title? They give you nine options. And even as a lawyer, when I buy a piece of property, I'm like, oh, it's wow, there's a lot of options. Community property requires typically a single court hearing, not a full-blown probate process, the 16 to 24-month process. Community property with right of survivorship avoids probate. If one spouse dies, again, if both spouses are deceased, you have a probate. There's a revocable transfer on death deed. Again, kind of like joint tenancy, running with scissors, not really a good idea. Uh, it, it Mandatory Medi-Cal reimbursement. There's a lot of bad stuff that comes with it. It's also a public document. So yes, it avoids probate. It's a public document. I believe there's one case out there where the child who was supposed to receive the property declared bankruptcy and the court, the federal court, which is a bankruptcy court, ordered mom not to change the deed So that when the mom died, that property goes to the kid's creditors. So I believe there's one case out there. So kind of scary. Spousal property petition is typically with community property. That is the abbreviated, um, that is the the process that you uh, probate community property. So this is between spouses. There's a Hegstead petition and an Ookstead petition. These are not made up names. These are real names. And the Hegstead petition stands for the proposition that the property was in the trust and now it's out. It was in the trust. But then like it got refinanced and taken out. There's a single, typically a single court hearing you can go to to put it back in. Ookstead says that the property was never in the trust, but there was some type of memorandum or writing or some other evidence to show that the person who created the trust intended for this property 
to be in the trust. Okay. And again, that's going to be a, typically a single court hearing in a probate court, not the full blown 16 to 24 month process in probate. There's an affidavit of real property of small value. You know, we don't see this a lot in California. If it's under 61,500, it's a different process. It's an affidavit proceeding. If it's between 61,500 and 184,500, it's typically a single court hearing. And that would be your petition to ter- determine succession to real property. So those are quickly, those are the 10. Um, 10 ways to to avoid probate uh, or to to not have to go through the probate process as well. well. I would say those are not great planning strategies. Okay, So don't rely on that as a planning strategy. But really, this is designed for someone who says, yeah, mom's passed away. Do I have to go to probate on this property and why? And, you know, what's the process? So this is really, if if that's you, this is for you. So let's talk about the probate process. Uh, The probate, um, there's a lot of questions, you know, who has the power to sign the listing agreement, right? This is going to be kind of right out of the gate. Mom died. We know we want to sell the house. Who can sign the listing agreement? When can we, when can we start marketing the house? What probate court documents will the title company need to before close of escrow? Now, this is really important because typically you're not going to know until about 48 hours before escrow is set to close. Title will say, oh, there's a problem with title or, oh, we need these five documents you may not even be able to get those documents from the court. Okay, so we're going to go over the documents that are needed. We're going to talk about full versus limited authority. This is where a court opens probate and gives a human, a person, full or limited authority to sell real property. There is a big difference, and we'll take a deep dive into that. The inventory and appraisal uh, for realtors, if, you know, if you're a real estate professional watching this, very important to pay attention to the inventory and appraisal because that can be very, very important, certainly within the context of limited authority. We'll talk about realtors commissions and um, that the fact that death is a change in ownership, you know, and a lot of people don't know this. We got a call, in fact, this week from a person who said, you know, I, I handled, you know, I didn't go to a lawyer. Mom died. We sold the house. I distributed all the money to the kids. And nine months later, I got a bill for, I was maybe 10,000 from the county that said, hey, there's this extra tax because when mom died, that's a change in ownership. And when Prop 19 occurred, there is no more a parent to child reassessment exclusion. So in this case, you know, mom dies, you maybe wait six months to, to wind up the affairs. You're not paying attention to anything. You're not going to go see the lawyer. You have an affirmative obligation as a trustee to notify the assessor of a change in ownership and death is a change in ownership. And uh, unfortunately, the, the assets had been distributed to the beneficiaries. And now the trustee says, who's going to pay the bill? Well, guess who pays it? The trustee personally. So that's really, that's kind of the final answer. So really, really important to pay attention to changes in ownership. I'm going to not belabor the, these points here, but I want you to know that some of uh, probate is a very complex process that has time limits. They have minimum time periods, maximum time periods. Some of these run concurrently and some run consecutively. It starts with determining what type of probate you need to file, if any. So if you reach this point where the realtor or the title company says, oh, you need to go to probate because there's a problem with the title. We need to figure out, you know, can we, if it's a living trust, can we do a single hearing? If it's a full-blown probate, what does that look like? Or is there some other type of mechanism? Is there some other type of process we can go through? Uh, you have to lodge a will when a person passes away. You must Even if you have a living trust, you typically have a will that leaves everything to the trust. And then you file a petition for probate and some other documents. The clerk schedules a hearing. That hearing then, um, you know, the the lawyer typically appears at the hearing, and if everything's in order, uh, there's a publication that has to happen uh, before that hearing. Then the court makes an order uh, admitting the will to probate if there is a will, uh, and if there's no will, then there uh, then there's no will admitted to probate, but they do appoint somebody called an administrator. The issue of bond comes up now. What a bond is is if the administrator or executor gambles all the money away, uh, you know, do the, do the heirs get the money back from the bonding company? It's not insurance. And many times wills will waive bond. If you don't have a will and you don't want to pay the bond, then uh, many times you have to get a waiver of bond. That's that's a whole other topic. And I'm not particularly a fan of waiving bonds. Um, it is tied to your credit. So a little granular, but bear in mind that there is a bond requirement that can be waived. The court then orders the clerk, admits the will to probate, and then orders the clerk of the court to issue letters. What does that mean? Well, it's a person sitting behind bulletproof glass that whips out a piece of paper, a single page, and it's called letters. Now, this is something your lawyer will prepare. If you don't have a lawyer, it's probably not a good idea, but you would need to know to prepare that. And then that's something that the lawyer prepares, hands to the clerk, and the clerk puts a purple seal on it. It's very important to get the purple seal 
not the black seal, because the black seal's a photocopy many times, and title companies will want the purple seal. And then, so you have your letters. Now you can close the estate uh, within you, only after waiting four months. You prepare an inventory. That inventory goes out to what is called a probate referee, who's a, appointed by the uh, the governor or I think the controller, uh, appointed by the state to value property in an estate. And then they say, "Hey, the real real property is worth a million bucks, whatever it is." Um, you have to send the executor has to send notice to creditors. So if you have known creditors, you do not have to do this within a living trust. With the Living Trust Administration, there's no duty to notify known creditors, but there isn't a probate. You pay debts, you file the decedent's last income tax return. You might also have to file a fiduciary income or tax return 1041. And then there's this report of sale of property. We're going we're gonna to take a pretty deep dive into that and, and the mechanics of that. If there's a surviving spouse, we generally recommend that people file an estate tax return to pick up something called portability. We cover this in other webinars, but I certainly would uh, look at that. The assets are, are taxable over $12,920,000 uh, currently in 2023, then an estate tax return may need to be filed, even though no tax is due. So if the gross value of the assets exceed that, and then you file your accounting to uh, and petition to close the probate, there's a hearing on that matter, and then there's a distribution and receipts so that the executor or the personal representative um, writes checks to people, distributes property, whatever it is, and then gets receipts. And then there is a declaration refinal discharge that then concludes the probate and discharges the executor. That's a lot. Basically, the same thing happens with a living trust without the formality of the court. So if you have a living trust, you're still going through a process. So let's talk about selling uh, probated real estate. So this is when, when someone's passed away and real estate is owned by a decedent and you are selling it within the context of a probate. So forget the Hegstead, forget the Ookstead, forget that there's a trust. This is straight up. There's either a will or not a will. A court has appointed a personal representative. The term personal representative describes a series of people, an executor, which means a person named in the will is serving under the will, an executor with will annexed, meaning that the named executors are not serving, but there is a will. And that executor with will annexed is somebody not named in the will, but appointed by the court. Then you have an administrator who that's in the event there is no will. And you also have somebody, something called a special administrator. The special administrator is appointed before a will is admitted to probate court. Um, and that's typically in a litigation or some type of urgency setting. So who has the power to sign the listing agreement? Nobody. So if you have a house and you want to, you're ready to sell this thing and get going, uh, really until there's an appointment of a personal representative. So nobody, the court has given no person legal authority to act on behalf of a decedent's estate. So if mom passes away and you know you have a petition for probate, that's not enough. So Typically, uh, you know, if there is no executor named or you run out of executors, uh, it, you, oftentimes we see a spouse, a child, a grandchild, um, you know, a parent, a sibling, uh, even a creditor can be executor, right? There is a priority of appointment that we'll cover in another slide. And um, the attorney represents a personal representative, rep representative, and the attorney also has a duty to the people who inherit. And these are what we're calling heirs loosely. Technically, heir means somebody who inherits in the absence of a will, but it seems a little bit better than an inheritor, but you can think of them as inheritors. And um, really the first thing, if, if you're looking, if you're kind of staring probate in the face and you're like, oh my gosh, do we need a lawyer? Do we not? And I generally recommend you, you meet with a lawyer, you know, whether you need a lawyer to complete the process, I don't know. The first thing the lawyer is going to do is look at the nature, title, location, and approximate value of each asset, because that drives what proceeding you you have. And so you might be able to do some type of abbreviated proceeding. We need to, as a lawyer, we need to look at all the relevant documents. So there is a fair amount of fact finding before we just jump in and do a probate. So there is a again, there's a priority of appointment. If there's no executor named in the will or no exec named executors willing to serve or or no will, the priority goes spouse, then descendants, then parents, then siblings, and so on. It sort of follows intestate and uh, intestate inheritance laws. So the person with the highest priority should be the one dealing with the realtor, right? And that's the spouse, then the children. So if you're a realtor uh, or, you know, it's a family and a spouse is petitioning for probate or the real, or the uh, maybe one child is petitioning to be appointed executor, that's probably the person who should be talking to the realtor to having having the preliminary conversations, essentially that, that point person. And you can tentatively, you know, make an arrangement with a proposed um, executor or administrator this sort of future personal representative. 
And then that person can later ratify the agreement. So it would be almost like a soft listing. It's like, okay, well, we found the realtor. Let's get the pro- What should we do? You know, should we need to clean the house out? And this is actually very important to clean the, the property out of a house. And I would say probably one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they don't get the stuff out of the house. And the reason is, is a buyer needs to complete a physical inspection. They need to see what they need to be able to see what it is they're buying, you know, the four walls and and the floor and the ceiling. And if it's full of stuff, then that can be uh, kind of difficult. So we really recommend people deal with the personal property. So when can you start marketing the the property? So once the, again, once a personal representative, this is the executor, the administrator is appointed by the probate judge and letters are issued, the property can then be put on the market. Now I'm, uh, you know, some people say, well, I don't want to list it on the multiple listing service. Uh, the California Realtors Association has a, f- a figure out there that says properties that are listed on the multiple listing service sell for an average 13% higher than properties that aren't. I have no idea how they came up with that figure, but it does make sense to um, to really market the property. Now, you may have a constraint. You may have um, you may have a tenant in a building who has an option to buy the property, so there may be a, some other type of of thing going on. But bear in mind that listing on the multiple listing service, especially if it's um, you know we're talking residential properties, does make sense. Once the uh, personal representative is appointed, there is a there is a box. There are two boxes, and one box is going to be checked. It's either full authority or limited authority. I suppose you could not check any box, which would be terrible. But what we're talking about here is either the full authority box is checked or the limited authority under the Independent Administration of Estates Act. So what this means is the person named as as, um, executor has less court supervision, less complexity if you have full authority. Full is better. Limited authority limits the person's ability to make decisions and as we'll see, it's a different process when it comes to selling the property. I would say if, you know, all things being equal, full authority is better and limited authority is not. Lim- with limited authority, the properties are subject to what's called overbid. And we'll talk about what overbid means. It's almost like an auction. Full authority is kind of like a normal real estate transaction with a probate um, flavor to it. Limited authority is an entirely different process. So we'll, we'll, uh, We'll cover that. So which California county handles the sale of property in in probate? So which one? Well, many times the probate will occur in the county of the decedent's residence because the probate rules say that the probate must be filed in the county of the decedent's residence. So it kind of stands to reason. If a person's living in uh, San Francisco County and they're living in a house in San Francisco County, that probate's going to be in San Francisco County. Now, if the decedent owns property in Los Angeles County, but as a resident of San Francisco County, then you're going to file in San Francisco, and then you're going to have the the San Francisco court be dealing with the Los Angeles property. Now, that is counterintuitive. You might think, well, shouldn't a probate proceeding be filed in the county where the real property is located? But in this case, if a decedent is a resident of, uh, of San Francisco, it would be filed in San Francisco County. Many times there's a mortgage. So it's often best to sell the home and pay off the debts, right? Because that's kind of a mandate. How are you going to pay the debts, the, the mortgage? If they say, well, you know, it's a million dollar property and mom had a $500,000 mortgage, that mortgage is due, right? And, um, you know, in many cases it's due. There are a few exceptions. Even if there's no debt, it may be better to sell the residence in probate because there are fewer warranties of title and fewer disclosures. Now, this is very, very important. So if it's an, a, the sale from an estate when somebody's passed away, there are fewer things you have to do and basically fewer reasons for buyers to sue you, for lack of a better term. Uh, and that's what that means by fewer warranties of title. So I would say, you know, if somebody asked me, is it better to sell property in the probate proceeding or is it better to sell it after the conclusion of probate? and the kids own the property, I would say sell it during the probate proceeding. And many times some of those expenses can also be tax deductible within the probate proceeding, not necessarily tax deductible uh, once once you're an individual. So how does a personal representative act on behalf of an estate? What happens? So you file a petition, the personal representative, and which is executor, personal representative, again, is that overarching term that encompasses a lot of different uh, names. It's in the sense of, you know, we when we talk about uh, people who serve in the U.S. Armed Forces, a, a sailor is in the Navy, an airman is in in the Air Force, and a soldier is in the Army, and a Marine is in the Marines. Right? We're giving an overarching uh, label, this personal representative for each of these roles. Um, again, you're going to get your order for probate, and then you will have your letters issued by the court clerk. 
And the court clerk is the one that puts the purple seal. And if you're listening to this and you're like, what's the big deal with the purple seal? The title company is going to want to see it. It's like that regal purple color, right? And um, that is something that is stamped onto the letters. They are a one-page document and, and there will be a box checked, full authority or limited authority. Pay attention to that, okay? Now, courts are different. County courts are different all over the state. Some people will give you your order and your letters the day of the hearing. Other other courts make you wait two months. So it may take a while. Now, you're appointed and, and uh, the letters may be issued on that day, but you may physically not get them for a couple of weeks. Sometimes a petition for special administration is used, and that's if there's urgency. So again, full authority makes life easier for everyone because your real estate transactions will flow smoother. Limited authority is more work and more risk that another buyer could come in and overbid on the property. So in a, in a hotter real estate market, um, that can be tough. Now we're in a, in a tight real estate market now. Interest rates have gone up and there are a lot of buyers and not many sellers. So, um, you know, that that's less certainty in the, in the probate process. So we're going to talk about, you know, what are the appropriate California Association of Realtor forms used in for a probate transaction? Again, this is really the context of residential uh, sales, not so much commercial because you're not, you, you wouldn't necessarily use those, right? And when can the personal representative sign your listing agreement? What's the allowable commission rate? We'll talk about that. When can you accept an offer? And what's a minimum deposit? And how does, uh, what relevance is there on the appraised value from the probate referee on the transaction? When is court confirmation needed? You know, it, this can be a real like black box, right? So if you're a realtor or you're a buyer uh, or you're a beneficiary, you're like probate, sale of real estate, what what happens? Like, what's the process, right? Sometimes you need court confirmation. Sometimes you don't. And then um, really, if you're a realtor watching this, you really should be able to articulate and walk your buyer through the overbidding process. So if you're a realtor and you take a listing and it's limited authority, you're really going to need to brush up on these rules if you're not familiar with them. Uh, you can have a, a $500,000 offer that's scheduled for court confirmation and we're going to calculate what the, the overbid is. So um, there, there's a calculation we'll walk you through. And um, and we'll walk you through the bidding process. And when can escrow close in a probate transaction? Okay, so once the order for probate and the letters are issued by the court, that's when you can officially list the property. Commissions are 6%, maximum 6% for full authority, maximum 5% for limited authority. I don't know why. If it's a mobile home, uh, many times those pass outside of probate. We're not really talking mobile homes. Those commission rates typically are higher. But what we're talking about here is typically residential real property, not, not the uh, personal property that a mobile home is. And each county can set their own written and unwritten rules. So a few years ago, California got rid of local court rules and they adopted statewide court rules, which just happened to be Los Angeles County's statewide court rules because a third of the population lives in Los Angeles County. So guess what? Every county got LA's rules. And some people say, look, what works in LA doesn't work in this county. And then they have their own unwritten rules. So you really need to investigate and check on what, what those are. And this is very important. The exclusive listing agreement cannot exceed 90 days. So if you are doing a six-month listing agreement, that's going to be a problem. So you need to know these rules if you're a realtor. If, you, if the personal representative has full authority, I'm going to walk you through that. Once the, again, once the order for probate and letters have been issued, the property can be listed. And a binding purchase agreement can be made using a probate purchase agreement. So this is a different agreement than um, with the California Association of Realtors forms than your residential purchase agreement. The, um, the personal representative with full authority is not bound to sell the house for at least 90% of its appraised market value. So what does that mean? Well, remember I mentioned the, the probate referee. That's not a person with a striped shirt and a whistle. It's a person appointed by the state to value property for state purposes and if it's limited authority, the property must sell for 90% of the date of death value. Now, here's the problem. The probate referee, you know, many of these properties are frankly distressed properties, right? They might have deferred maintenance. There might be some problem and it may be very difficult to move that property in some markets. And so you may have to get a reappraisal. So if you can't seem to get that number up to 90%, you can get a reappraisal from the probate referee. And really that's where the lawyer comes in and can kind of work with the probate referee and explain to them the problems with the property. But there's no binding, there's no requirement that the property sell for 90% of the value of its appraised value on the inventory and appraisal. There's no court confirmation. 
The offer can be accepted without waiting 60 days for a probate referee to value the property. So this can be sold before the inventory and appraisal uh, is, is, um, is done by the, the probate referee. And potential buyers can be informed that no con court confirmation will be required, but notice of proposed action is required. So it's something different. So this is not something that is a noticed court hearing. It is a notice of proposed action. And then there's a consent or an objection typically with that. So notice of proposed action is filed, uh, is required to be filed with the court and mailed to all beneficiaries. So if anyone objects, they have 15 days to file an objection with the court. So it's mailed out. It's a quick, tight turnaround. If they say, well, that property is being sold for, you know, 70% of what I think it's worth, they've got 15 days to file their objection. And you cannot close escrow until this 15-day period elapses. Now, it can be waived if all interested parties sign a waiver to the notice of proposed action. So let me give you some context. And, and, and certainly in a foreclosure setting, you may need to do this um, to, to avoid the um, a, a sale on the court step. So let's say that that you've got an escrow and you're set to close and you have a probate opened and the title company says, oh, we're set to close in 48 hours. We don't have your notice of, of proposed action and consent. So the lawyer uh, says, all right, we'll get that written and circulate those to uh, all interested parties. They sign off and then, then you can proceed with the close of escrow. So title companies are, are very uh, cognizant of this and they know the rules. Um, a minimum 3% deposit is required. So this is um, not a 10%, but it is a 3% requirement. So if somebody's not willing to do a 3% deposit, that's probably a weaker buyer, quite frankly. And under the limited authority, it is 10%. So it's a higher deposit requirement. You will need certified copies of the order. This is very important. A lot of people don't think they need a certified copy of the order, but if you're a lawyer or you're an executor, Make sure you get a certified copy of the order and the letters. Those are two separate documents and the notice of proposed action. So typically that's going to be a certified copy. So let's talk about sales that the personal representative has limited authority under the Independent Administration of Estates Act. Now, the sales price must be within 90% of the appraised value that the court-appointed probate referee determines after the judge makes an order for probate. You're not going to get that for probably 60 days. You may not get it for four months. It, you may not have complete information. This thing could drag on six months and you, you know, you've got a house and maybe you have to make payments or, you know, there's nobody living there and you're going to have some issues with homeowners insurance or, or any type of fire insurance on a vacant structure, whole host of problems. One reason why limited authority is bad. It cannot be lower than 90% unless the property is reappraised. So there's just no authority to sell the property unless that property appraises for 90, unless it sells for 90% of its appraised property. An inventory and appraisal must be signed by the probate referee before the property can be under contract. So this is very important. You need that really before you can put it under contract because you just won't know. Sometimes a probate referee informally will say, yeah, I'm behind. I'll get you the, the inventory and appraisal in a couple of weeks. You know, Could it be subject to the um, inventory and appraisal coming in? Perhaps it's probably better to have it. And then you've got some, some um, you know what your, your, your bottom number is. Notice of sale of real property must be published in a local newspaper in the county where the property is located. Now, I don't know about you, but I really don't see newspapers anymore. So I don't know what's going on here. Um, this can be really challenging. Um, if there's no newspaper in the county, <laughs> then the judge or the court can order a different, um, a different publication, but it must be published three times over a period of no less than 10 days before the sale. And the third publication must be within one week after the first, must be at least one week after the first. So if you're a math person, that's a word problem. You can help us. Most of these publishers know what to do. Um, I'm not even sure I could figure that out. So the notice informs the public that the property uh, will be open to auction at court. You know, hear ye, hear ye, come all to the courthouse steps and, and overbid on this property. So a little bit like a movie. So uh, let's say, and the initial deposit's 10%. The buyer must clear all contingencies except the contingency of court confirmation. So you have to put a lot of work into this. This is where I'm going with this, right? Inspection, uh, you know, whatever sort of financing or whatever it is, you've got to clear all those contingencies um, except that of court confirmation. And once they're cleared, then the report of sale and petition for order confirming sale of real property can be filed with the court. This discloses the total commission, sales price, the address of the, of the property, the values provided by the probate referee, the deposit amount, and the starting overbid with the formula for overbid. So if the sales price is $526,000, the first overbid in court must be $552,800. 
the original bid of 526 plus 10% of the first 10,000 of the original bid, uh, 1% of uh, $1,000 plus 5% of the original bid minus 10,000. And that magically comes to $25,800 is the minimum over bid. If this is totally confusing to you, that's kind of the point. A lot of archa archaic laws, a lot of arcane ways of doing things, not a good place to be. If you're stuck with limited authority, uh, you have the risk of overbid. And it, you know, it can be really frustrating if you're a buyer. So if you're somebody who says, hey, I want to invest in real estate and I want to get a good deal on a probate sale, um, you know, there may be a place for that, but know that it's it's just going to go to the highest bidder. So the filing fee, filing fees change currently, they're $435 uh, that the estate pays that. Once paid, the court sets a hearing date. At the hearing, the overbidders appear in court, kind of high drama. The probate attorney will request a 10% deposit from all bidders. They show up with cashier's tech checks, okay? Multiple cashier's checks in different multiples. And once the sales confirmed, the probate uh, judge signs an order confirming sale of real property. It is sold to the highest bidder. So the personal representative cannot sell it to the second highest bidder, who's his friend, or maybe it's a personal representative. It must go to the highest bidder. I will tell you, I did these earlier on in my uh, in my legal career, and they were kind of exciting. Um, you 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 go to the courtroom, and you you know you they say, okay, go out in the hall, and there's a there's an overbid process, and and um, you know it's a little bit of drama. So escrow will need a certified copy of the order to close escrow, and the the escrow must be given the taxpayer identification number of the estate. So this I, I put this in bold because. When a person passes away, you stop using the decedent's social security number and get a new social security number or taxpayer identification number, which is a nine-digit uh, numeric number, like a social security number. And um, and you have to have that in order to close the probate. Once escrow closes, realtors get their commissions and the buyer obtains possession of the property. The heirs do not have access to the money. This is very, very important. The bank proceeds must be deposited into the estate's bank account until probate concludes. So if you have beneficiaries who say, yeah, mom's house sold for a million dollars in in you know on the courthouse steps. When do we get our check? Well, we covered this a few slides ago. You don't get it till the very end after a petition to close the estate. So if you're a beneficiary and you're thinking, hey, once that house sells, I can get my hands on the money. It's not the case. It's gonna, it's gonna take some time. So, you know, kind of kind of looking uh the difference checking a box makes. If you're a lawyer, you absolutely have to pay attention to this, okay? And if you can get full authority and there's real estate in the in the estate, uh, I really would suggest uh, going forward with a full authority, limited authority. Uh, you know, you you have to sell that property within ninety percent of the value, uh, or at least ninety percent of the value. You don't have that requirement with with full authority. No court confirmation with full authority. You have this whole co court confirmation process. Less deposit with full authority, and more certainty for a buyer. I think that means probably a higher sales price if it's full authority versus limited authority. More risk, more uncertainty. I think that has a negative effect on market value, um, all things being equal. And uh, once the order for probate and letters have been issued, the property can be listed uh, and binding purchase agreements can be made on the probate purchase agreement. So full authority makes life easy. Limited authority makes it more work and more risk. So what forms do you use? So if you're a realtor and you're watching this, um, the residential listing agreement which is the uh, the California Association of Realtors form RLA and um, the residential income disclosure regarding real estate agency relationship and uh, possible representation of more than one buyer and one seller potentially. And you've got your wire fraud and then your probate purchase agreement. So this is not the residential purchase agreement. It's the probate purchase agreement, slightly different agreement. If you don't, if you're not familiar with this, maybe talk to another agent in your office who's familiar with probate sales, talk to your broker, uh, get some help on this. For a trust, use the residential listing agreement and the um, disclosure regarding real estate agency relationship, possible representation of more than one buyer, and the um, there's whole electronic fraud form. So these are a lot of forms. If you're a realtor, you're going to be familiar with these. And the trust advisory uh, and additional forms potentially if applicable. And the uh, representative capacity signature addendum. So it's a person who's signing in a representative capacity and that's an addendum to the agreements. So then it brings us to the petition for final account and for discharge. Only after all the assets are marshaled, debts paid, only after then, after the real estate's sold, all the cash is in the account, can the estate close. The personal representative, the executor is then discharged and it's over. 
receipts are filed, and the probate comes to a conclusion. This takes typically 16 to 24 months. The lawyer and the personal representative are not paid until the matter is over. So if you're a lawyer saying, wow, this sounds really good because probate fees on a million dollar estate are about $50,000 and the lawyer gets about half of that. The executor gets about half that. That's even if there's 950,000 in debt on a million dollar property, those fees are still $50,000, but you have to wait 16 to 24 months. So if you can work and not get paid for two years, probate may be for you. The, P, the fees are paid from the assets of the estate, but there is another way to go. We can avoid all of this with a funded living trust that makes everyone's life easier. And we don't have to do any of the stuff I just talked about. So it can all be avoided with a custom tailored, fully funded, revocable living trust. I cover this in my book, Savvy Estate Planning. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to, to get a copy of it. Uh, it's a lot of stories. It's not dry, you know, legal stuff. Uh, it's out in the second edition, available on our website, also on Amazon. And for more information, check out our YouTube page if you're not looking at this on YouTube. And we have a lot of, and oh gosh, I think we have maybe over 150 videos now. We do this pretty much weekly, and we put these videos up on our YouTube page. We have offices in Northern and Southern California, but within driving distance of, of most Californians, uh, and we're always on Zoom, right? Um, and uh, if you'd like to schedule a time to speak with someone at our firm, you can schedule a free call. Now, we won't be talking with a lawyer. You'll be talking with someone who'll figure out you know, which lawyer you should talk to. And then uh, and then we have a process for that. So you can you can ask the phone team. Uh, you can also uh, email, right? You can also um, communicate with us electronically. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Next week, income smoothing, lower your taxes. If you would like to pay less income tax, who doesn't want to pay less income tax? This is for you. There is a strategy called income smoothing. And what it is, if your income kind of goes up and down over years, you can smooth it out, take advantage of low tax brackets. Maybe you do some tax deferral strategies. Maybe you defer taxes, right? It's kind of like an interest-free loan and you're paying those with inflated dollars. Not a bad deal. By the way, this is what rich people do. And if you're a rich person and you're not doing this, you probably should be. So great webinar to watch, income smoothing, you can lower your taxes. And if, you've, if you're watching this on YouTube, you might've already seen it because I think these go reverse chronological. Anyway, we'll open it up for questions. If you're watching this on YouTube, thank you for watching. Keep watching because it will magically roll to the next webinar. And we'll see you next time.